I had painted my paintings with a lot of delicacy, and now they were torn up or destroyed beyond repair. How could this happen? With the paintings of the National Gallery at stake, Asefi devised a plan that could have gotten him killed. He volunteered for a job restoring paintings that had been damaged during the wars. Once inside the gallery, Asefi needed an accomplice. He found one in Inayat, a member of the National Gallery staff who shared Asefi's contempt for the Taliban. Risking their lives, Inayat and other staff members brought endangered paintings to the room where Asefi worked. I worked in this room, but back then, there was no furniture, desk, or chair. There was nothing here, only a rug. I would place the paintings in a corner and work on them. It was here that the real sleight of hand took place. The Taliban condemned paintings that portrayed living things. Dr. Asefi made the offensive elements disappear. I suddenly came up with the thought of using watercolors on top of oil paintings to hide the unacceptable parts. My trick worked. The paintings did not show that they had been retouched or converted. Month after month, Asefi and his accomplices ran an art rescue factory right under the noses of Taliban religious police. The penalty for such organized treason? Probably death. Whenever they would come, I would lock the door. The doctor was inside. He would stop his work, having understood that somebody was here. Naturally, I was afraid, because the Taliban were everywhere. Ultimately, Asefi's team put about 80 retouched paintings back on display. The Taliban inspectors never noticed their subterfuge. After the Taliban's fall, Asefi simply wiped off his handiwork. Despite all the suffering and hard work, our goal was to change something. And we did it. Besides art, the Taliban regime seemed to declare war on fun. Bird fights, dancing, even kite flying were banned. Today, Afghans show they haven't missed a step. For Dr. Victor Sarianidi, the main show is just ahead. This afternoon at the Presidential Palace, the Russian archaeologist hopes to witness the opening of a treasure he has not seen for more than 20 years. Only he can verify if it is real. And that's where Victor's friend and National Geographic fellow Dr. Fred Hebert comes in. He will be in charge of scientifically cataloging the gold to promote research and exhibition of the rare objects if they're there. Oh. Finally, the wait is over. The destination, the presidential palace. The mission, to determine if the Bactrian horde still exists. We're gonna go through a series of checkpoints, and we're going to then proceed through the front gate of the presidential palace.
Deep within the innermost chamber of the presidential palace, tensions are high. Could the Bactrian gold have survived the civil war and outlasted the Taliban? Will the safes said to contain it be empty? Bad news. The key to the safe is nowhere to be found. It was probably lost years ago. If the delicate treasure is inside, will it be damaged by the saw's intense heat? My heart was just trembling. I was worried about the gold, I was worried about the artifacts, I was worried about everything. Over 20 years of waiting finally comes to an end. The first object emerges from decades of mystery. This is the first piece. A golden floret hairpin Dr. Sarianidi pulled from the earth a lifetime ago. It's like seeing an old friend again after 25 years. You didn't even know if he is still alive. And now you realize he's right here, waiting for you. On a winter's day in 1978, Sarianidi first laid eyes on the object. About 2,000 years before, it had belonged to a nomad woman, perhaps a princess. She had likely been buried in secret, her grave unmarked. This would prevent thieves from looting the royal cemetery. We think that the royal family probably buried their dad in this old ruins because the ruins had ghosts that would keep people away. So the burials were saved for 2,000 years. The princess was between 25 and 30 years old. Adorning her were layers of dazzling gold jewelry. No one knows how she died and little is known about how she lived. Her people, Bactrian nomad warriors, had once been little more than illiterate bandits. But by the princess's time, they had learned the ways of commerce and grown rich as middlemen on the Silk Road. Silk Road trade would enrich her region for a thousand years more. And within 400 years, it would fuel an artistic golden age at its great oasis, Bamiyan. In Bamiyan, Nadia and Dr. Tarzi clean Buddhist sculpture created during that golden age, around 500 AD. They come from an excavation Tarzi believes is the monastery that will reveal his personal holy grail, Bamiyan's sleeping Buddha. To Dr. Tarzi, it's unsurprising that the monastery is rich with Buddha's sculptures. This region was one of the first in which Buddha was represented in human form. Before that time in India, Buddha had been represented by symbols, footprints, a tree. It's because of Greek influence that Buddha is represented as a human, because the Greeks were already attributing male or female traits to Zeus, Aphrodite, Venus, and Athena. In Afghanistan, this Greek influence dates from Alexander the Great's invasion around 330 BC. The conqueror established cities and left behind garrisons of soldiers in what's now Afghanistan and Pakistan. When Buddhism spread westward from India in the centuries that followed, it was met here by descendants of Alexander's armies. They had a taste for depicting their gods in human form. The hair imitates the hair that you find on Greek statues.